Good morning, good morning. Let's stand to our feet so we can worship the Lord together. Yes. Come on. Thank you. So it's okay if you like are still praising because we did say let endless praise resound or praise resound, right? So if you're still praising even though I'm yakking for the next two minutes or so, that's okay. You can have a seat too. You can actually praise while you're sitting. Just praise with your eyes so it looks like you're excited about me talking. Awesome. Hey, uh, we are so grateful that you're here today. We're so excited about what's going on. Uh, we're excited about the second week of the My Story series. And um, if you thought last week's story was good, it was. And if you're thinking this week's series or uh, message might be good, it is. So y'all should be excited. 
Yeah, I'm serious. So here's the thing. If you are brand new, uh, we're excited that you're here, okay? There's so much for you to learn about DC3 just by sitting here this morning. But the one thing we hope you learn more than anything else is that you're loved. Is that the fact that you are here is important to us. If you are first online, if you are online for the first time, you just found us, and uh, it's the same thing for you. Now, it's going to be harder for us to reach out to you online, but we will do it, and hopefully your moderator will let you uh, in on all that. But if you're here, now, now, you're, now you're ours. Yeah. Really, what we want for you to understand is that we believe in a very simple phrase, real love and real people. Okay? That's what we, that, that's, that we, we go by. It's a beautiful thing. And it's based off Jesus' words in the book of Mark where he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. It's a twofold commandment that has equal, equal appealing. So here's the reality. If we love our neighbor, we are loving like God, right? And if we love God, we have no choice but to love our neighbor. So we believe that wholeheartedly. So if you're brand new, man, it just... just Take in what God has for you in this service. And we may be a little strange at times because that's how we roll. All right? You already have probably understood that just by me talking. That's all good. But we would love to know that you're here for a couple of reasons. Number one, we're not going to chase you down, but we just want to know how we can answer any questions you might have. Uh, please feel free to ask. Or uh, we just want to be able to say, hey, um, can we help you through something? Okay, these are ways that we would love to connect with you. So there's uh, two ways you can do that. First off, you can text CONNECT to the phone number 941-208-0078. And you'll get a, a response text, and that'll help you along the path of, of connecting that way. Or there's a connection card in the back of your front seat. Yeah, that's how it works. Good. I said it right. Uh, and that card, you can fill that out and drop it into any of the giving boxes that are inside the auditorium or the giving center outside and yes I did use the term giving because we believe that God asks us to give that, that God says out of the abundance of your love for me you can give back and that's an opportunity we have we don't do that by passing offering plates though nothing wrong with that we are cheerleaders of any church that passes an offering plate uh, we choose not to do that and for those of you that are new it's, it's for you uh, we just want you to know that that we don't put pressure on you to give but but those people who are our family, those people who reside in the DC3 community, that's something that we trust God will work with them through and they'll drop them in those giving boxes or out in the giving center. All right, so that's cool. Uh, there's a couple of things right there. Um, and as you can tell, I'm kind of swimming for a couple of seconds because my mind has come to a blank. So let's just dwell on that for a second. All right, awesome. So uh, we have a lot going on today uh, and, and we're excited you're here. Don't forget, Plan now to stay after the service because the second session of our discovery series is today at 12.15. So, so just plan on staying because we don't care if you are brand new or whether you've been here for 19 years. The goal is for you to know more about who God is and more about who we are so that we can best build the kingdom together. Sound good? Excellent. Hey, we have some videos for you. That uh, Actually, it's just one video, but it's a collection of videos because it's JP and... He's a vision video collector. It's up here. Just watch that. It's fall, y'all. And it is time for it to come and join us. How is this even possible? We're, we're inside. <sighs> that was beautiful. Lovely. That is very nice. So, anyhow, come join us at the first... Perfect. Come join us at the first annual DC3 Festival of Fall. Oh yeah, it's for all ages and everyone in our community. There will be free food, carnival houses, bounce, wait, carnival games, bounce houses, giveaways, and fall fun. That's, there it is, right there. It's gonna be even more funner than that. Yep, so bring your friends and neighbors. For invites, stop by the Big Blue Tent in Punta Gorda and the Welcome Center in Northport. Actually, just stop by one of those places. You don't have to go by both. Just pick one. Um, we'll see you there. If you have any questions or would like to volunteer, contact Brandy. There we go. btown at dc3.tv. That's what I'm talking about. All right.
There we go. Happy fall, y'all. Hey, it's that time again. Time to serve the boys and... No, not that time. Come on. It's... And by the way, um, this is South Florida. The leaves don't even turn... That color. You know what? Never mind. It's this time again. Time to serve the boys and staff at Crossroads, a home for boys. Now this is an amazing opportunity to serve, but to also invest in their future. We do maintenance projects and develop relationships with DC3 family. So come live out the great commission of Jesus with us. Lunch will be included. Contact Brandy if you would like to go at btown at dc3.tv. Perfect. Hey, it's that time of year again. Guys, for the last time, really, not the same announcement. We are looking for detail-oriented servants that love Jesus and people to help with Operation Christmas Child shoebox distribution. That is going to be happening on Sunday during our services at both campuses. All you need to do is sign up by contacting Christina at kdunson at dc3.tv. that you're here. We really are. Because we feel like the Holy Spirit has something for you today. And uh, let's do that together, all right? Let's stand. Let's say hi to each other. I mean, you haven't seen each other all week. Say hi to each other. And we'll get rolling. So that's where we praise him, indoors, outdoors, everywhere. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. I want you to catch that. Why do we praise him? For his mighty deeds and his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And then it says again, praise the Lord. In Hebrew, praise the Lord is hallelujah. And we're gonna do, I raise a hallelujah, which is probably a very familiar song to you. But I want you to think about it in terms of what we've just read. I raise a praise the Lord. I praise the Lord in his sanctuary. I praise the Lord outside in the mighty heavens. I praise him for his mighty deeds. I praise him for his excellent greatness. I praise him with dancing. I praise him with cymbals. I praise him with the trumpet. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's raise it up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies, come on. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. 
We praise you for your mighty deeds and your excellent greatness, Lord. We praise you for the blood of Jesus that covers us, that has been applied to all of our sin and all of our fear and all of our worry and all of our doubt. Praise you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Glory to his name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I know that beyond the shadow of a doubt. I, I love these songs because they speak to my heart in the most difficult moments. Can you imagine raising a hallelujah in the middle of a storm? But that's exactly what that song was saying. Doesn't matter what I'm going through. Doesn't matter what I'm facing. I'm gonna, hallelujah. I'm gonna raise a hallelujah. I said, I'm gonna raise a hallelujah. Somebody in this room gotta raise that hallelujah. I, I know we're going through some storms. I know it's hard. I know some of you this morning didn't even wanna be here. But you made it. You made it. I don't know what you were facing. I don't know what kind of fight you had at home. I don't know what kind of traffic you got through to get here, but you made it. You were watching online, internet wasn't working. It was cutting in and out, but you made it. You made it, because we got to raise a hallelujah. And then I sit back and I think about that last song and I'm like, wow, God, thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood, because whatever I'm facing, it doesn't face what you faced on the cross. It doesn't even match what you suffered through. And you did it for me. You did it for her. You did it for him. You did it for her. I love it. Can you imagine? Because that blood washes me white. Yo, I'm messed up. I'm not perfect. I am not perfect in any way. I don't know that any of us is. I don't know that any of us is. But the blood on the cross of Calvary that was shed washes that away. We are made new creatures because of his sacrifice. How many people give thanks for that? That's worthy of raising a hallelujah, right? Praise God. Let's take some time to talk to him. Lord, we thank you right now. Father God, we lift up our hallelujahs right now to you. Because without you, where would we be, Lord? Without you, where would we be but with you? We can do all things because you strengthen us. With you, we have victory. With you, there is hope. Even when situations seem hopeless, God. I may not have anything physical left to give. And I still want to press forward and give you everything. Because you take my nothing and you turn it into something great, my God. Father God, I'm so grateful to you, Lord. I'm grateful for each and every person that is standing here today, that is sitting in this place, because you brought them here with a purpose, my God. I am believing for miracles today. I am believing for transformation today, Lord God. I'm believing for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like never before. I'm believing that there are people who are going to leave this building completely different than the way they walked in, my God. I know, Father God, that you have a word for us today. You are going to challenge us to move to that next level, God. And so I ask you right now, Lord, receive this service of worship that we've given you and prepare our hearts to feel, Lord, to, to just receive, to just delve into what it is you have for us through the word of God today. Father, I pray special anointing over Steve. 
Father God, use him to give us the words that we need, not what we want to hear, but what we need this morning to take us to that next level with you, God, to bring us closer to your throne. Father God, to grow the kingdom, my Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, if we don't accomplish those things, Lord God, then what is the purpose? And so we thank you, God, that you've given us your purpose, that you've given us the great command to love you and love others. Father God, we thank you in this moment. Take everything that we have brought today, Lord God, and let it be used for your glory. Every negative, every positive, every situation in between, let it be for your glory, God. We want you to use us. Have your way today, Lord God. Have your way. This is not about us. This is about you, God. So have your way in this place. And we surrender every trial, every burden. We give it to you. You said to cast our cares upon you, Lord God. So we cast them on you right now. We let go so that you can speak to our hearts. God, we're ready to receive. We're ready to give all that we are to you. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. And all God's children said, amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Give him one more praise. Come on, one more praise. One more praise. He's worthy. Raise that hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you are able, go ahead and have a seat. Hallelujah. First Kings 17 shows one of the most memorable moments of Elijah's ministry. He had been staying in solitude by a brook, living quietly and simply. But God redirects him to Zarephath, a Gentile city. And it's interesting to note that this is also the home region of Jezebel, a ruthless queen who would very soon have a life-altering encounter with Elijah. God simply says, go to Zarephath. Go is a Hebrew word, halak, which means to go, to walk. But in this context, it conveys the further thoughts of a journey that may include difficulties and dangers. Even the name of the city, Zarephath, means to smelt, to refine, to test. Clearly, God had a bigger purpose in this command to just arise and go. Now, Elijah was directed to meet with a widow. In that day, a widow was typically left in a state of extreme poverty once her husband died. That is emphasized in chapter 17 when it's noted that this woman was out collecting sticks clearly a sign of her devastating poverty. In the story you're about to hear, the Bible says that this Gentile widow was commanded by God to feed the prophet Elijah. This Gentile woman, who undoubtedly did not serve Elijah's God, became an instrument of God by her act of service. In the middle of her extreme poverty, this woman fed Elijah first before herself or her son. Now, during the prophet's stay, he remained in what appears to be a room with a separate entrance at her home, allowing both the woman and Elijah to maintain their reputations. And the entire time, their needs were met because of her act of obedient service. But then, something tragic occurs. The widow's son becomes sick and dies. She then directs her pain toward Elijah, asking if this is what he had in mind all along. Did he simply come to eventually kill her son? But in that burst of sorrow and anger, she says something telling. She also asks if he came to remind her of her sin. She doesn't mention what that sin would be, but it appears that this widow was living with the guilt of some sort of past sin. Perhaps that memory was haunting her and she just blurted it out in a time of extreme emotion. Was she actually blaming herself for her son's death, thinking that somehow Elijah's God was punishing her? Since Elijah knew that God had led him to this widow, he saw this as a problem that needed to be fixed by the one who had him on this assignment. So he spoke to God and exhibited his own emotion in the process. His 
posture in prayer was unique. His words were filled with a raw and honest passion. And in that moment, the widow's son was raised. This is the first time in the Bible that we see someone raised from the dead. Her obedience in making a simple meal for the prophet resulted in God meeting her need. She didn't just give, she gave at great risk. And remember, she may have known of God, but she was a Gentile woman, and this was not her God. This poor Gentile widow became the centerpiece of one of the greatest miracles that had ever taken place. This became her story, <laughs> and what a story it was. Good morning, everyone. Tell somebody what a story it was. Speaking of stories, what is your story? What's your story? There's an old song that was released back in the 2000s, early 2000s, and it starts off with a, a standing with a blank page before me. Anybody remember that song? You see, all of us, if you have your Bible or just pretend, open up right now. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, I want you to grab one in front of you. I really would love for you, as we dive into a whole chapter this morning, to dig into this. If you're not a church person, this is a great time for you to experience the Word of God. Uh, there's nothing weird or spooky about it. It is God's love letter to us, but we do believe it's active and alive. And we give Bibles away if you don't own one. Just take it home with you. That would be an amazing thing. But here's the cool thing. Just like Brian talked about in our Between the Lines summary, there is a, a component to the story we're about to read in the Bible that just amazes me, that God prepared the widow's heart to minister to Elijah, and she was not an Israelite or any of those things. How does that happen? Here's the good news for us today. How many believe on some level the world today is a little whacked? Raise your hand. Yeah, I mean, man, we were talking this week about school and where to send our kids and, you know, homeschooling, private schooling, Christian schooling, public schooling, and all these things. And I know we have great Christian teachers and leaders and students in our public schools, but, man, in society today, things seem to be going crazy sideways in the morals department and, and when it comes to Christianity in a country that was founded on the Word of God, we seem to be in such a post-Christian, even anti-Christian culture, and I go, God, where's the hope? Does anybody ever feel hopeless besides me? It's just like, I'm just going to go on to Revelations, Lord, come quickly, and here we go. Pew! <laughs> Tell somebody, we out. But that is not a loving attitude. That's a selfish Christian attitude. Because what I know is there are people outside these walls and probably inside these walls today that are just like that widow. That you know of Jesus, you kind of know about him, you might even comply to some rules as a foundation of your life, but do you really have an experience? And here's the cool thing today, as we have prayed for you, turn to somebody right now and say, he prayed for me. Now is when I freak you out. I believe that God is going to write something new on the page of the story of your life. My prayer is that when you leave here today, that you will be different. I'm going to tell you, you can't sit under that worship and not walk out of here and not be a little bit different, right? When we celebrate the blood of Christ and what he's done for us. So I want you to go with me today as we think about this and think about, God, what do you have for my story today? And I want you to go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. If you are not a Bible person, it's kind of in the front of your Bible. It's in the Old Testament, and this is written about the kings in the time of Israel. We talked about King Saul last week, the first king and his tragic story. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about the widow Elijah and her son. Just to give you a context of this, Elijah was a prophet of God. God spoke through him. Powerful uh, uh, story 
uh, of Elijah all through his uh, ministry career. And then we have the widow, who we don't know her name. We know where she's from. We know that she's not a Jew. She is uh, a, of a pagan religion where they worship Baal. And then we have her son, who is young. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. So go with uh, me to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Let's read the Word of God together. We're going to do real fast. Sarah always tells me I read too fast. So I'm going to go through the first little sections real fast and then get to the meat of our story, okay? So stay with me. Put your seatbelts on. Here we go. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tish in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years. How many like, hallelujah? That's a problem, okay? What do we call it when it doesn't rain? That's a drought. Okay, so we are in a drought, except at my word. Then we have another cool little story we learned in Sunday school where Elijah camps out with the ravens, and that is not the football team, okay? Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Why is Elijah hiding? Well, if you prayed for God or for the economy to shut down for years, how many know there are going to be some people who don't like you, right? You got, you got to get out of town and hang out with the ravens a while. So God is directing and keeping him safe, okay? So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan, and he stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. How many know that's crazy? Birds feed him. It's, it's really cool. Then we go to Elijah and the widow at Zarephath, the meat of our story today. Sometime later, the brook dried up. Everybody say, uh-oh, because there had been no rain in the land, and you turn to the person and go, duh. There you go. So that's obvious, okay? Then the word of the Lord came to him. Notice the word of the Lord is coming. Now, here's something you need to know. Can I put a little side note in here? You're not going to hear the word of the Lord if you're not spending time with the Lord. If you're not reading his word, if you're not listening to him, if you're not asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to miss it. So that's just a little side note for someone that needed that this morning. Be faithful in your disciplines, in your devotional life. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once. Everybody say at once. Don't fool around. To Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. That is the verse that messes with me. Now, you're talking to a person irreligious, doesn't believe in God of Israel, of Yahweh, probably multiple gods. We know Baal is the central God. And yet, God is conditioning their heart. This is what gives me hope. There is a culture out there, people that desperately need Jesus. And there are people right now, think of someone that's lost, some that, someone that doesn't even like church or those things. Think of the most hopeless person you know. And look at the widow and say, God can condition their heart. Oh, man, we're, thank you, Anita, for that. The person you want to see come to know Christ, God will work on their heart if you will pray for them. Amen to that? I watched my cousin up in Alabama, he's like my uncle, get radically saved for Jesus. He was literally in a small town. Anybody watch Andy Griffith? Right? You know, you know who Otis is? Town drunk? Well, that was my cousin who is like my uncle my dad's age. In fact, my dad never had to fight because he would beat the you-know-what out of everybody in the place. And it's good to be a cousin with him. He was the town brawler. I mean, literally... This guy, you did not mess with him because he would cut you or kill you. I don't think he killed anybody, but he definitely hurt a lot of people. And he was so anti-church. And I watched God miraculously save him as a hornet flew into his Grand Torino. Anybody watch Starsky and Hutch? All the young people are going, what is he talking about? Anyway, into his shirt, put him on a path, an oncoming path with a semi-truck on a two little tow lane road in Alabama. And somehow he says, I don't know what happened. Something grabbed the wheel, took me off the road, put me back on not a scratch. He got radically saved. I saw hundreds of people come to Christ through my cousin because God conditioned his heart. Amen to that? It's an amazing thing. There is hope. Tell somebody, there's hope, baby. And, he's, and he's, so we see, I have directed widow there to supply you with food, verse 10. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, watch this story. A widow was gathering sticks. 
She was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, Hey, I'm adding that. That's not in there. And bring me, please, a piece of bread. Now, we see the widow who complies to the drink, but now she's going to stop and say something. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar. Think about this. I want you to see it, guys. Let's see it. Only a little handful of flour in a jar, okay, and a little olive oil in a jug. For those of you from the north, olive oil. I'll make sure I get that right. No busting on my Alabama accent and no busting on the game last night, you sinners. Okay? All right. Some of you felt you had a word from the Lord for me this morning. Like, hey, y'all lost. Hey. Uh, No compassion in this church. Anyway, just kidding. Yes, I know I need to be reminded. Keep me humble. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son. Now watch this, that we may eat it, hyphen, and what? Now, literally, this is crazy. I got to, I got to, you know, I I try to limit my commentary, but this is just too good. You have a woman, for some reason, that is starving to death, her and her young son. What about just begging? What about help from the community? What's, What's going on here? Anybody ever think that? But this is the things we need to get inside. Now, this is hard for Americans. How many people have you seen starve to death recently? How many people do you think need to starve a little while besides me? Okay, right? Seriously? This is something that's really hard for us to get inside our heads. Now, the closest I have a need is going to Honduras and watching those kids come to the dump to get food and to scour through this stuff. And if you've never been on a missions trip, that's why you need to get out of this country. You need to go see that America is... Not perfect, but we are so stinking blessed here. Amen to that. So here is this woman who can barely, I mean, she has got, she is living on ration food. She's down to the last. She can barely move probably. She's probably skin and bones. And she's going to go home, make a meal, lay down by her kid, her little boy, and they're going to die. They're that close. And it's just going to be a matter of days, if not hours. Yet, there is a, a strange thing that's going on where she said, I'll get you a cup of water. A strange man? That, does that not mess with anybody else? And here's the crazy thing. He asked her to get a cup of water in the middle of a what? A drought. A drought. So this is not an easy task. She's got to, you know, back then, I mean, Arnie will tell you, they didn't have running water, right, Arnie? You had to go somewhere and get water. Just like he, I mean, digging wells in Africa so women don't have to walk miles and and potentially risk sexual abuse and, and kidnapping and all this kind of stuff. This is ancient culture. And yet she says, okay, I'll do it. But then she says to him, I barely have enough, and we're just going to, we're going to die. And we see this. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. Notice God doesn't ask her to be irresponsible and lack compassion for her son. God's never going to tell you to neglect your family to do ministry. Oh, somebody needed that. God's not going to call you to sacrifice your children at the altar of your service to Christianity, but he will call you to step out in faith and do things that don't look logical to the human eye, to the culture, okay? So going on, what did she do? Okay, so she says, um, I lost my place. I'm getting there, guys. Da, 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 da. She went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was, f- and, and here's the crazy, crazy thing: the jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the land. So she went. Everybody say she went. 
She went away and did as Elijah told her, so there was food every day for Elijah and the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, and keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Everybody say, good ending, amen. That's awesome. So, continue on. Now, Elijah's renting a room where things are going well. They've got food. They're getting better. They're getting stronger. And sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse, the little boy, and finally stopped breathing. Everybody say he died. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come? And this is what Brian pointed out in such an eloquent way in his behind the, between the lines segment he said did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son did you come to remind me of my sin is this some kind of sick joke where we get better and now your God is going to take it out on me because I'm not a follower watch what happens give me your son Elijah replied he took him from her arms carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I'm staying with, causing her son to die? You know what's really cool about that passage? How many would consider yourself a follower of Christ, and yet you have doubts some days? Anybody? Man, I'm... Next week we're talking about Thomas, and Thomas is my man because I struggle with doubts and skepticism. I need apologetics. I need a lot of stuff to help me along my path. It's really cool. And God is growing me in my faith every day. But at some point you just got to go, God, man, I just don't get this. You got to help me with this, God. Elijah was distraught. He had formed a relationship with this family, you know, and he's renting a room from them. All of a sudden what's going on? And so what did Elijah do? Because of his love for these people and his love for God, he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child, carrying him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, and he was excited. There's an exclamation mark here. Look! Your son is alive. How many get excited when you see people that go from death to life? Raised to life here. Our, yeah, our raised to life services where we do baptism. I know you guys love to hear me preach, but those, no, you're not, no I'm just kidding. I, I, those are the best. Those are the best sermons when you see people raised to life. You're going to hear one in just a second. Now, I wanna, want you to see as we wrap it up in verse 24. Then the woman said to Elijah, I want everybody to read this quote with me right here. Everybody go, here we go. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Jesus is the truth, the way, the life. And what we see here is a son that was dead and resurrected first messianic prophecy that we see with resurrection. But later, it would be us as children that are destined to die, but the son would die and would be resurrected so that you and I will never have to die a spiritual death. Amen to that? Isn't that amazing? Nothing but the blood? That's awesome. Now, what do we do with this today? I want to give you three quick observations give you a challenge, and then give you a story. First of all, we see a woman, might she, if she'd been an American and things not going the way they should, what would she do if she, if she had Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, right? This stupid drought, right? These people, you know, if a guy, strange guy came to you and said, give me water, and you're like, what? Right, yeah, right? So what's going on with that? Did she gripe? Did she complain? Here's point number one, guys. Some of us today, we need to turn your, you need to turn your complaining into compliance with God's word. Pull your toes under your chair, and I'll try to, listen, that's for me. 
God is saying, we talked about it last week, obedience is better than sacrifice. And God is calling us to do stuff. And some of us are so busy watching what the world's doing and all the wrong things that we're missing what God wants to do and all the right things if you quit complaining and start obeying him. Amen to that. Thank you for that. That's good. Guys, this is something, listen, when I say that, I don't say that with condemnation. I say that because I need to hear it. Because I love to complain. I love to tell the news anchors how they're wrong. And ask them where they got their education and all that kind of stuff. And go, are you, you know, a lot of words I shouldn't say. If you don't believe me, Philippians 2 says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. Now that I'm awake, it's even more important to comply with God's word. I'm adding that. Work hard. Everybody say work hard. To show the result of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything. What is included in everything? All right. What's excluded? So, do everything without complaining and arguing. How many know we could just give the altar call right there and we could stay there for two hours probably praying? Do everything without complaining and arguing, guys. This is the word of the Lord. So that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God. And watch this. Shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. What? If you want to change the crooked and perverse world, stop complaining and start obeying and complying with God's word. And watch what happens when your life, you're going to have more joy. You're going to have less frustration. You're going to have less, ah, oh, whatever. And all of a sudden, people are going to go, what do you got? What if you're drinking or smoking? I want some of that. And you tell them, hey, right here, baby, this is it. But, but so we see the, the, the widow who says, okay, you know what? I can complain, but I can get him a, a cup of water. There was something amazing about the condition of her heart. Matthew Henry and, and Melly, I'm going to back up, talks about here's a starving, weak, heartbroken, alone uh, woman, but she was in this industrious, humble state. He says in, her, in commentary in 1 Kings, her mind was brought to her condition And she complained not of the hardship she was brought to, nor quarreled with the divine providence for withholding rain, but accommodated herself to to it as well as she could. She didn't even believe in the God of Israel at the time, but she thought, well, this prophet guy prayed, and so maybe it's true. And, And Matthew Henry says, such as are of this temper or this mindset in a day of trouble, are best prepared for honor and relief from God. And I believe that there are people here today that you're just so frustrated with your life, so over how are things going, that you're going, you know what? I'm just going to do the best I can. Try to be a good person. Don't know about this Jesus thing. Listen, God has you in this place or listening today for a reason. He's prepared your heart for something amazing, if you'll just let it, if you'll just follow. We go from turning your complaining to compliance because just as she was going to get the water, Elijah said, hey, by the way, will you bake me a piece of bread? And then she objects, but what does she do? He says, well, if you'll do this, God will give you this. Now, she's still not totally bought in, but all of a sudden, faith rises up in her. She at some point goes, if I turn the light switch on, the light might come on. If I make this bread for Elijah, it might work. And what other option do I have? Right? And so she steps out on faith. And guys, point number two is faith requires commitment, not just compliance. You need to obey, but you got to commit to it. You got to give something. You got to give something that costs you something. So she went, but something amazing happens. She sees God work, and she's like, wow, this must be true. But then the real deal happens. Her son that she loves gets sick and dies. And what did Elijah tell her to do in exchange for his life? What did Elijah say for her to do? Nothing. What did Elijah do? Pray desperately to God. God, 
save this boy's life. And here's what we do. We go from compliance to commitment. Watch this, guys. To Everybody say complete surrender. Complete surrender to God comes when you realize that you have nothing to give and everything to gain. My friends, this is living in the salvation of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I didn't come to tell you how bad you are. I came that the world might be saved. And here she asked the story, have you come to expose my sin? Is God punishing me, your God, for my sin? What would her sin have been? Well, here, Baal worship, what was it? Baal worship was rooted in prostitution and sexuality. Now, I want you, here's where Steve's mind goes. Could it have been that she was so caught up in that promiscuous, crazy temple stuff that her and her husband got into it, Right? Because that's what they did. There was just craziness going on. And all of a sudden, her husband gets in a spat with another dude. And before you know it, one of them's dead and it's him. And now she's just used up. Nobody wants her. Or could it be because what, another thing that was done in the worship of Baal was children's sacrifice. And it was a common practice to appease the gods of Baal that you would sacrifice your firstborn. And what if somewhere along the way she had taken her first little baby, and it could be from here to here, and said, I'm sacrificing you for fertility or for good weather or for food or for whatever that was. And now she has no husband. She lives with the regret of taking her own child's life. Moms go with me there, right? And she's just resigned that my life is not worth living. I'll do the best I can, but I'm going to die. And then what? We see Elijah pray a desperate prayer over this Gentile, non-Jewish son. And God, the God of mercy that goes beyond race, color, socioeconomic status, anything. He says, because I love all that I created, I will show the world what mercy looks like. You see, my friends, God will test us, and our true dependence of faith often becomes clearest in the toughest droughts of our life. Our true dependence, our faith, often becomes the clearest in the toughest droughts of our life. And I want to ask you one question before we close What is my willingness to wait on God even in the wilderness of my life? Are you willing to make a commitment? Are you willing to go, Lord, I don't don't want to just be compliant or just be, if I do this, then I expect you to do this. God, I want to go to a next level of complete surrender. And I'm going to tell you guys, when you get to that place of complete surrender, God will do everything amazing things. I want you to turn to somebody and say, are you ready? So here's the question. What is the next chapter of your story? And as a teenager and young adult, I did what people did, you know? There was drinking, there was experimentation with drugs, promiscuity, all of those things. Basically living a life just for myself, what made me feel good, what society said was good, all of those things. So I was raised here in Port Charlotte by two parents that came from different religious backgrounds. And so the institution of church wasn't a part of our family. So I started working for a group of chiropractors, doing their marketing and public relations and all of that stuff. And they kept inviting me to church. And I was like, that's okay. Those people are a little weird. I'm not gonna gonna go, but you know, you guys are welcome to do whatever you want. Well, as I kept living life with these people, things were different. They responded to tragedy and different things differently than how I was responding. And so they invited me one time to the September 11th one year anniversary and John Maxwell was gonna be speaking. And I thought, 
oh, John Maxwell, I learned about him in business school. He's not a Christian. He's not going to talk about God. He's not going to try to make me drink some crazy juice. So I go, and he hit with a truth bomb. And I was sitting there after the service just bawling. And the youth pastor and his wife came up to me and asked me, what's going on? And I said, I have no idea what's going on, but I feel like nothing is ever going to be the same. And so I prayed to receive Jesus as my Savior, and I never looked back. Um, I stopped drinking completely, um, stopped being promiscuous, stopped doing all of those things. I even dropped a lot of my friends and just got heavily involved in a young adults ministry. I ended up working for the youth pastor <laughs> that helped to, to you know, be there for me um, during my initial phases of becoming a Christian and what that looked like. Um, and through that, I felt like I had received the gift of healing from the Holy Spirit. And so that's what kind of got me into chiropractic because I saw these chiropractors that were healing people um, in a natural way, praying for them, just loving on them and healing them. And I knew that God had called me to heal his people in some kind of way. So I had been a Christian for about 10 years and I was graduating from chiropractic school and moving to Charlotte, North Carolina to join up with other doctors to run a practice there. And there, it was a huge practice. We had a lot of staff, different doctors working together. And the lead doctor, Matt, had brought in a coach from Toby Robin, Tony Robbins. And he was coaching us and we were meeting with him at different times throughout the month. And at the end of the month, we had a final session with him. And what we had to do was to culminate everything that we had kind of discovered about ourselves. And he had us draw a triangle on a piece of paper. And in the middle of the triangle, he wanted us to put your purpose, why you were created. And I just started crying and I didn't know why. And then finally I realized, because my purpose up until then was to become this chiropractor and to heal people and to see as many patients as possible and just get people off of medicine and be healing the way that they should. But that wasn't my purpose. That wasn't why God created me. That was what I thought God had created me for and what I was pursuing, but it wasn't my actual purpose. So from there, I started at the time I was attending Elevation Church. I started getting more involved in that, doing their leadership program, working more into their leadership there at the church. From there, I went on a missions trip to Guatemala, just a seven-day missions trip, and I was there in the mountains, and I heard God say, you are home. And I had been on other mission trips before, to Africa and other Bolivia, different places, and you just feel that when you're on a missions trip because your guard is down, you're vulnerable, you're just hearing the Holy Spirit in different ways. But for some reason, God kept on me. And when I got back to the United States, and I was getting ready for my friend's wedding the day I got back, I was in the bathroom getting ready and I audibly heard God say, pack and go. And I ignored it. I ignored it and I was praying with patience one day and God interrupted the prayer in my mind and told me, sell your things and go. And so at that point, I didn't even know what Craigslist was. I didn't know what any of that stuff was. Um, so I had an assistant at the time and I asked her to look into all of that. And so I started putting my furniture on Craigslist. I had this whole list of things that I told God he was gonna have to make happen if I was gonna go to Guatemala. I'm a strong-willed woman, and I thought I was gonna tell God what's up. So down to, I had just renewed my lease in Uptown Charlotte in my apartment. I had a car, all of these things. And just one by one, God just miraculously took things off the list. And I was still not 100% sold out to it because I was like, why would you bring me down this journey of all of the schooling and just everything I had been through? God, why would you do that? And then finally, somebody came to look at my table, and the lady was from Guatemala. And then I knew right then and there that I didn't have a choice at this point. <laughs> this was the, the path I was on, and I could fight God for the rest of my life, or I could just go. And so I sold everything, and I moved to Guatemala. So you might be sitting there thinking, what does this have to do with me? And I just want to share with you that I was pursuing things that I felt were going to make me successful or that I felt like the world wanted me to do. And I'm not saying it's not okay to be successful, but what I am saying is who is dictating the definition of success in your life? And what I've discovered is that when I serve Jesus, when I love people, when I think I've given and I can't give anymore, God always fills me up 
and I always get something and I get more than what I gave. And that's what drove me in Guatemala on those days when you didn't sleep at all and you were taking care of kids and adults and teens and doing all the running around and even here now working at the church um, when you're just spent and you have nothing left to give. God will never bring you to something that he can't bring you through and you always end up better. The, the power is in the process and we are all in a process. It doesn't matter if you don't know Christ or you just received him as your savior or you've been walking as a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years. There's a process for a reason and God brings us through a process so that we can become more like him, so we can love his people better and so we can be better and we can live better lives. And he always provides for us. You know, sometimes I'm like, how am I gonna make a car payment or something like that? And then someone gives you a car. It's amazing things like that and it's when we're not expecting it and it's definitely not what we've asked for, usually, <laughs> but or how we asked for it. But God always takes care of his children and that is in his word, so I know that that is the truth. And so I encourage any of you out there today that are feeling a tug on your heart, something that God is calling you to do that seems completely radical and completely crazy, I just challenge you to press into that because I'm telling you from experience, He will give you more of the Holy Spirit than you could ever imagine. And there is so much peace and so much amazingness in that. And so I just challenge you to press into that and just see what God is going to do because He's amazing. There's not even words to describe it. He's amazing. My name is Brandy Town, and my story is his story. Thank you, Brandy, for sharing that amazing story. I want us to close our eyes. We're going to pray. Father, you're calling every person in this room to a next level. Lord, maybe they came here today, not even a church person, a Christian. They don't even know what all, this is all about. But something, you have prepared their heart for today. Lord, there are people in here that are complying and rule following. They're doing their best, but you're calling them to a new commitment. And there are committed people in this room that you've got something extraordinary waiting for them. You're calling them to complete surrender, to letting everything go just like Brandy did and say, God, here I am. Use me. What I want you to do today, guys, is Amy leads us in that beautiful song one more time. I want you to just focus on yourself. Spend time with God and say, God, fill me with your love, with your knowledge, with your direction. What are you calling me to do today? It's in the name of Jesus. Stop.
we just conclude this time knowing that you've covered us and today if there are people maybe for the first time are saying Jesus I want to give my heart completely to you they may not understand it completely but God something in them right now they know they need to answer that call and I pray right where they sit they would do that and just say yes to Jesus Lord I thank you for what you're doing today to call us to a new level we ask that we would not forget this day and we would write on the pages of our heart a new story. It's your holy name we pray. And everybody said, <coughs> amen. Pastor Cliff's going to come, wrap us up real quick, guys. You can be seated real quick. Thank you for being with us today.
So just imagine we show up next week and only half of you are here. Because the other half heard God call them someplace. Mm -hmm. Heard God's voice saying, I need you to do this. What do you think that would do to this church body right here? It would energize it like there's nothing else. To see a group of people passionately follow the Spirit. It's another scenario. What would happen if next week you show up and you can't find a seat anywhere? This whole place is so full. People need to stand in the back. People need to flow into our, into our fellowship hall. People need to stand out front and watch it on the TVs because there's just so many people because we who are sitting here answered the call and said this isn't good enough. Just coming here and sitting in the auditorium, it isn't good enough. Because God's calling me to something else. God's calling me to his call, to his vision, not mine. I got to tell you, I love my vision. But if it's not God's vision, it's just me with bad eyes. Some of you may have given your life to Jesus today. You said, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of something bigger than what I'm experiencing in my life. If that's you, we would love to know about it because we don't want you walking alone. We want to walk alongside you. That's a big step. That's a life-altering step. We don't say yes to Jesus and just keep going in what we've been doing. We say yes to Jesus and we turn. That's what repentance is. Repentance isn't just, I'm sorry. Repentance is, this is where I'm going. This is the sin I'm looking at. This is repentance. We turn our back to that sin. If that's you, we want to know. There's a couple ways you can do that. Uh, you can pull your phones out and just put uh, dial in 941-208-0078 and just type the word forgiven. That's one way. You can fill out your connection card and do it that way. Either way, we want to follow up with you. Here's the next really cool thing. Today, after this service, you heard me mention it before, is our second discovery session. This is where we're going to learn more about our faith. It doesn't matter if you were at the first one last week. doesn't matter. Come to this one. All of you. Wouldn't it be cool if we saw this whole place like this? Because we're so passionate about learning more about what God has for us. That'd be awesome. We're ready. Come on. Let's do it. Okay? But above all else, God has called you to something. Don't walk out of here feeling, feeling good about hearing a message. All right? People online, don't just turn me off if you haven't already, and just feel good about being part of a message. Pursue the voice of the Spirit. Follow Him. Don't just put it aside. That's not what God called us to, all right? We have a whole community out there. We have a whole space of people who need to hear about Jesus. And he's calling us to do that. So let's build the kingdom. Let's go out there and have a blast changing the world because we're just being dragged around by the nose by the Spirit. How cool would that be? Oh, that's great. Hey, have a great week. Change the world. We love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. There's a blue tent out there if you want to find out more information. There's a VIP huddle if you're new. Go on out there and do what you got to do. Meet a pastor. Do all that kind of stuff. Have a great week.